We'll start easy with the icebreaker. Are I've we... actually been doing that recently. Are we recording? Yes. We're recording right now. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Just pretend I'm not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've been starting with the icebreaker because I found that it's a cool way to start the conversation without here are this person's credentials, here's this person's background. Like I'd rather the listener get to know you as a person, mm -hmm. like from the get-go. So today's icebreaker, since we are talking a lot about ages and population growth and things like mm -hmm. that, what is your ideal retired life look like? My ideal retired life. Oh, geez. Um, retirement, I have a complicated view of retirement. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that I'm a person who wants to retire from work. So it, it's one of those things where I would love to be in a place in my elder years where I don't have to work for money. So I don't have that mm. pressure. Okay. Right. Um, but I think an ideal retired life for me is going to be living in a place I like, um, with a community of people that I get along with and having some sort of daily purpose other than, um, just bringing enjoyment to myself. You know, I think I'm going to have to find okay, something yeah. a little bit, <laughs> a little bit bigger, <laughs> Does any specific place or community come to mind? Um, honestly, I saw an episode on Netflix of this show called The Most Amazing Homes in the World. Okay. And it's a really gaudy show. I mean, the houses are insane. <laughs> but they profiled this really unique home in Japan mm -hmm. where these elderly people kind of lived more communally. Okay. In this really cool house. And I think I would like something kind of like that. I think I would, I don't want to live alone. I think in my right. elder years, I think I would want to live with other people in a house and kind of more of a shared life. Okay. Um, where it is, just not somewhere cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meaning uh, above like 60 in the winter? Uh, I don't know if I want to be dealing with snow. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I okay. mean, uh, the, the place that comes to my mind is like the desert, like Palm Springs okay. or Palm Desert. Yeah. But, but that's also really hot. So I'm not sure about the place. I just know the kind of life right. that I'd want to live. In that example you gave with the... Japanese community do they have assigned responsibilities and that kind of a thing I think they do yeah I okay. think I think it was more in this example of the show I think it was a like two sisters that owned a home okay a really unique home and they gave um they rented out rooms or or um provided a home for these other people their age and there were activities and they cooked together. Right. And I think they were kind of artists. So they did art. Um, but and it was kind of designed for them, for people in their life stage. Okay. Like even the way the house was designed, it like wasn't, um, it had ramps and okay. like. Yeah, accessible. But it was really aesthetic. I mean, it was really beautiful because it was on that show. So <laughs> it was very unique. It was basically the world's nicest senior housing. It, basically okay. yeah and i think it was in like rural japan or something <laughs> you know forest area right yeah. and once you move there you'll probably live till 125 130 i yeah, i gather they were quite old <laughs> and doing really well they probably ate really good diets yeah yeah what do you have in mind for occupation i guess quote unquote occupation because you didn't necessarily want to work for money so would you make art would you build custom chess boards oh man i don't know i mean i'm asking that question now in life so you know i'm not 100 percent sure um just something useful something useful to people I, i'm i'm a helper 
mm-hmm. by temperament. You know, I, I just enjoy doing things and um, seeing the value of the work that I do helping other people. So just anything to where I can um, bring value. Okay. And gotcha. feel good about it. Yeah. Okay. We'll keep, I mean, we'll keep this episode and then in what I like 40 years or something we'll see if it came true if it came true no that yeah please hold me accountable for that (laughs) remember tell me what I said so that I don't forget (laughs) I'm really excited about this episode um I just want to say first of all I appreciate all the research you put into this Caleb sent me a I'm holding in my hand well it's double-sided but a four-page essentially thesis on his topic today (laughs) and uh it's appropriate though because it is a very complicated topic i think there is a lot that goes into it and i enjoyed reading through all your notes and as well as the articles that you quoted caleb what is your i used to think statement so my i used to think statement is i used to think the u.s was the center of the world then i went to india okay all right Uh, let's unpack this let's let's do this (laughs) I think first question a listener would have um, briefly is why did you go to India and then what was India like? Yeah. So um, I'm in my early thirties now and, you know, in my twenties, I had the opportunity to travel quite a bit. Um, Never for like a super, super long time, but a lot of, a lot of trips to different places around the world. And so India was the time I, it was the place I spent the most time. So the the first time it was right after I graduated from college and I went on a a missions trip with my university and we taught English as a second language in like a slum area in New Delhi, Mm -hmm. India for three weeks. And then um, I went back five years later. So my first trip was in 2014 and then my second trip was in 2019. It was funny. I was in India both times that Narendra Modi was elected prime minister. So oh, I'm not familiar. He was it. he's the prime minister and he got elected in 2014. I was there when that happened. And then in 2019, it happened again because okay. their elections are every five years. Okay. But um yeah. So then in 2019, I went back for like seven weeks just on a more personal basis, mm-hmm. um, which is a whole story for another time. But I I went to seek the health advice of an Ayurvedic doctor. So, <laughs> which is super crazy and a, and yeah, a story for another time. But I was there for seven weeks the second time and three weeks the first time. When you first brought up to me that you went to India to see a doctor, I didn't, th- this didn't even cross my mind, but Jess said, that is very Dr. Strange of him. <laughs> very Dr. <Doctor> Strange of me. <laughs> have you seen the first Dr. Strange? I, I have not. Okay. So I'm going to have to get context he, for that. He literally, he's a surgeon. He goes to another country to get his hand looked at because oh. he can't find any cure in the US. <laughs> yeah. So so it was a similar, it was a similar situation for me too. Um, yeah. Very Dr. Strange of me for sure. <laughs> so yeah, the, the first time I went, I was in New Delhi for three weeks. And then the second time I went, I spent one week in Mumbai, but the rest of the time was in a town called Pune, which mm-hmm. is uh, like three hours um, southeast of Mumbai. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, you have it here on the email, but what was your first um, impression once you landed? So... I'll be honest, I was pretty scared okay. to go to India. I, I think I would too. I haven't been. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm a a white middle class Westerner from Southern California, you know, who's lived a very um comfortable life in a lot of ways. And, you know, India is the country that is probably the most foreign to to me um and so i remember when i signed up for that trip with uh, cal baptist which is where i went i was like this is crazy i i <laughs> never thought that i would ever go here um and i i was nervous i was yeah. nervous i remember landing there um the plane was landing and i was uh we flew Emirates, which is this really nice Middle Eastern airline, and they okay. have cameras that you can watch outside of the airplane. 
and uh, you they have like a landing gear camera, which is really cool. And I just remember like watching us land like on the landing gear camera and just I could tell like I am in a very different place <laughs> and I have no idea what to expect. Absolutely no idea what to expect. And like immediately everything was different. Mm -hmm. I mean, like even just exiting the airport, like there we didn't queue to get out of the airport. Like everybody just kind of like went in a mob through this little little funnel exit okay and we almost got into an accident with a truck on the road going to our hotel it was yeah it was an abrupt an abrupt start but there's no other way to like <laughs> to like start like it, it's the traffic rules are totally different like everything right. was different so i'll read um a little bit of how you described it you said the language is different the density, road, road rules and traffic, um, sense of personal space, the food and the taste and the smells, everything is different. Um, how did you... Let me rephrase, let me think. Did you feel like you got used to anything after a certain amount of time or it was more like, okay, preparing yourself every single day to just kind of like go out into the world and make it through the day? Um, yeah, no, you, you get used to, used to certain things. Um, so yeah, it just, it challenged, it challenged me. So that, that first, that first time that I was there, yes, the sense of personal space is different. There are so many people hmm. like, I mean, there's 1.4 billion people in the country. We were in Delhi, which is a massive city. Right. And so like we were taking our mode of transport um for the first trip that i was there we took the metro a lot and then we also took um auto rickshaws a lot and you know it, the metro was packed i mean i've been on metros all over the world but like this took the cake in terms of the number of people that you can pack on a train and just like getting on the train like having to fight through people to make sure that you got onto the train from right. the platform i mean like brush like just brushed up right up against people like for a long time um so it was super fun like i loved it it was so different and it was fun um yeah and there was a little bit of like you did get used to some of it but some of it you know yeah you just had to prepare yourself like before you went out of the you know, the bed and breakfast that we were staying in and being like, okay, let's do this, <laughs> you know, because even crossing the street, like um, hailing rickshaws and negotiating the price. Okay. And the language barrier. Right. Um, yeah, it was a lot to navigate. I had a friend who went for a wedding in 2018 or 19. It was actually one of our good friends wedding and I couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. But he was describing to me how it was probably the first time in his life he was in a situation where he thought he was actually going to die, was being on a rickshaw, um, driving through like a mountainous area. Oh, and he's boy, asking yeah. himself, how in the world is the suspension on this thing still okay? Um, yeah. And I think it was raining as well. But that's so that's one of the reasons I think. You said scared. I don't know if there's a word that describes being more than just scared. I get, I hate being on boats. I hate being on like very rough car rides. Yep. And so anything like that would just absolutely, absolutely freak me out. It's, um, yeah, I, I would say probably one of the most shocking things to someone who has never been there before is the way that the roads operate. Mm -hmm. It is, it feels like a free for all. Now it isn't. There's just different rules. Okay. Um, but it's a very, like, if you're on the roads taking a rickshaw in a big city like Delhi or Mumbai, there are tons of rickshaws, tons of motorbikes, tons of cars, just kind of going for it. Now, okay. there are obviously directions that you move in, but there aren't, like, lights here. There aren't as many, like, traffic lights like there are in the u.s so okay. it feels really chaotic um 
and they use their horn to communicate in a completely different way. <laughs> like here, if somebody honks a horn at you, you can easily be offended. Like right, that there's some malice there, or some intent. Right. Like, oh, wow, this guy's being a jerk or whatever. Right. There, I mean, the auto rickshaw driver is constantly using the horn to either let other people know that he's coming let someone know that they're he's going to overtake them okay or he's upset or you know like it it can mean so many different things um it's like almost a tool okay for for driving like a communication device like a communication device and right. like it's and it, it can't it can feel like uh Mr. Toast Wild Ride a little bit. <laughs> um and when I was there, I mean like I just I think I routinely overpaid. Like I tried to negotiate <laughs> a little bit. Okay. Um like trying to be polite. Yeah, I mean the exchange rate is really favorable to the dollar, right? So right, I and right. I don't I don't want to be uh miserly or whatever, but Towards the end of my trips there, I would try to negotiate down a little bit. And, um, you know, even even still, even still, I, rem I remember one time, this is like my last night on my second trip there, I tried to negotiate down with a rickshaw driver coming outside the mall, just saying, okay. this is too expensive. Like 400 rupees to go like three blocks, like, no, <laughs> come on, man. And I talked him down to like 200. Okay. And this this young kid, he just when he got we got done with the ride, he was just beaming. He just he had gotten a great a great price. Oh, I see. Okay, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> funny, and I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> but it it was it's um it's really an experience driving there, and I was really scared to cross the street. Like I remember being in Mumbai needing to like get somewhere but like not knowing I, I had crossed this crossed the street successfully many many times but like this was a big boulevard and i was just like there's no way that i can cross the street <laughs> like it's just not gonna happen i like uh there isn't a crosswalk in the right area like there's too many cars it's just not gonna it's not gonna happen <laughs> in reference to negotiating my last trip to taiwan which was uh, almost exactly a year ago, when I would go into small shops, I learned really quickly not to speak English because I could pass as a Taiwanese native. Um, but once I spoke English, they knew, right? I was from the United States. Got it, yeah. So I, I had to remind myself, don't speak English until, you know, after I buy my item because once they hear the fluent English, I mean, all of a sudden this this item becomes like five times more expensive. Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, it was just such an interesting phenomenon. Too. Yeah, it was It was <laughs> the same way there, for sure. There there was the white Westerner price and then there was the locals price. <laughs> and I knew that. I knew that yeah, right. and it wasn't a big deal. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Okay, I'll let you get into the good part now about going back to your statement, right? The yeah. US was the center of the world, then I went to India. So, um, yeah, I'll let you start. Where in this would you like to explain that statement? Yeah, so I think, you know, regarding the statement, you grow up in your culture, you grow up in your country, right. and there's a tendency for every human being, this is a universal experience, for you to think that your way of life is what's normal mm. um, or that your country or that your life experience is kind of the center of the universe because it's the center of your universe right you know it's what you experience on a daily basis and so growing up in the u.s you know the u.s is just like the economic juggernaut of the world we have such a cultural influence on the rest of the world and we have a really high quality of of life and living in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain sense of superiority that comes along with that, like a feeling of like American superiority. And so it can feel, at least to me growing up, I felt like, man, like, yeah, the U S is like the center of the world. Like where's the, we're the best, <laughs> we're like the best. <laughs> and so relating it to the, um, I used to think 
Mm-hmm. You know, I would say, yeah, I used to growing up, like I thought America was the bomb. We had it figured out. Mm-hmm. We were culturally superior mm-hmm. and people needed to be more like us. And yeah, I mean, I think I, in a lot of ways, I love America. I'm an American. Um, and I think there's a lot of great things about America, but I mean, I would say I used to think America was the center of the world. Then I went to India. What I mean by that is, is just like traveling around the world and then particularly going to India where there's so many people and it's so different. Mm -hmm. It's really the population thing. It's really the people thing. Okay. I mean, like, I think I was just blown away by how many human beings there were living a completely different life and experience to me. Mm. And so it kind of changed the way I look at the center of the world. It's not to say India is the center of the world, but I'm just like, right, right. I'm just like kind of blown away by the fact that there's a billion people in India, a billion people in China and a billion people in Africa. And there's only 330 million Americans And it kind of made me think differently about the human experience. Right. I'll I'll let you give the statistic on what percent of the world's population is in the United States. Because this blew my mind. 4%. 4%. Now, population data, from what I've gathered, is kind of a little bit of an inaccurate science. I don't even think that... um, we actually know the total number of people in the world. I think it's estimated around like 8 billion. I think we hit 8 billion in 2022. Okay. But give or take, there's only like 4% of the world's population that are American. I I can't even like, (laughs) like four out of a hundred people. Yeah. I just, (laughs) and and we have such an outsized impact on the rest of the world. Yes, as far as influence and yeah, cultural influence. But population wise, yeah, I think it just it was kind of humbling and kind of revealing for me and to realize that 96% of the world does not have my life experience. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want this to sound like, oh, you know, kid from America goes overseas and realizes that he's not the center of the world. Like, I don't I don't want it to come across like that. I just think like, this is what happens, right? When people travel, like this right. is what happens when you go around the world. Like your, your mind expands a little bit because you've seen how other people, um, that there are other people around the world living differently than you. Mm-hmm. So it's a good thing. It's like a, it's like a mentally expanding, um, experience right and at some point during this conversation i want to expand on because you said it's that it is ultimately a good thing and i think um acknowledging that being able to travel is is a privilege i mean not everybody gets to do it not not everybody gets to travel within the united states um but let's see i'm flipping the page here now on, on this email um so you brought up objective truth claims and how this well first actually let's do this you had an you had an alternate i used to think statement so i think yeah. i'll let you bring that up and then let's define some terms within that cuz i think it would be helpful yeah so my alternate i used to think statement was you know maybe a more fun thing to say would be i used to be ethnocentric and now I try not to be. Okay. I guess that's not really a I used to think statement, which is why I went with the other statement. But yeah, I guess I used to I used to be ethnocentric and now I try not to be would be the way that I would phrase that. And really that's capturing the same idea. So I guess let me define what what ethnocentrism is. Okay. That was a term that I learned in anthropology in college, and it always kind of stuck with me, like the idea of it. But really, all it means is to apply one's own culture or ethnicity as a frame of reference to judge other cultures, practices, behaviors, beliefs, and people. Mm -hmm. Instead of 
using the standards of the particular culture involved. So it's like, it's just viewing the world and other people through the lens of your own experience and not being able to put yourself in another person's shoes or another culture's shoes when thinking Mm -hmm. about their customs or their way of life. Right. So, you know, kind of the view that I used to have where like America is the best and we're superior and everything. I mean, that's, that's viewing it through my culture, you know, like, um, whereas a more nuanced point of view would be, well, so just because something's different doesn't mean that it's bad Mm -hmm. or just because I think I have a better way of doing something doesn't mean that there isn't also another way of doing something that is equally okay. Right. I think ethno, the negative part of ethnocentrism, because everybody is ethnocentric to a certain degree, the negative part is where you apply a superiority to it. Right. And it'd be like, okay, like my culture is superior and better mm-hmm. and the others are inferior. Um, I mean, it's not that things aren't like, uh, better or worse, but there are some things that are kind of like just cultural and that's okay. Right. I think it's important to bring up that there is a negative side to ethnocentrism because I think it was just the Wikipedia page on ethnocentrism saying that sometimes it has a negative connotation, but based on its original definition, it it actually doesn't. It's just, as you were saying, a way of looking at your own culture and a way of looking at others' culture. Um, And I think that's important to bring up because people, um, I think I just, I've I've heard it used as a way to, um, wait, let me rephrase this. I agree with you in that there are things about the United States that are unique and better in the sense of, okay, depending on the standard, if you want to look at, like you mentioned earlier, the quality of life, the United States on average has a much better quality of life. There are things about the United States that are unique as far as seeing how individuals in the United States might have better access to, to healthcare or things like that. Um, so we actually haven't talked about this, but when you say that you used to be ethnocentric, used to think America was the best, what did you mean by that? Was it was it as far as like economically? Was it um, political views? What did you mean by America was the best? Um, I think that I kind of grew up with an idea that America is the best kind of mixed in with also my religious upbringing. Hmm. So it was kind of like, America is is God's country and we're uniquely blessed and we're successful because we're uniquely blessed by God. Right. And um it was kind of a mixture. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, the data shows that America is uh, that Americans are healthier and more successful and richer than their counterparts. It was more of like it was more like, no, our ideas, our system of government, okay. our founding, like all of that is superior to the rest of the world. And okay. it's led to us having a better way. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of what it was. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. It sounds like it's root- a lot of it was rooted in the founding of the country that, and you hinted at, Christian nationalism, which yeah. I think a lot of that comes from the idea that the founding fathers were uniquely chosen, divinely, divinely chosen to start this country, this city on a hill, which has been used. Yeah. I, I think that might be a Puritan phrase. Yeah. And it ties in with the idea of like American exceptionalism and like, like that America is exceptional and was kind of been like set apart. And it kind of ties in today to that idea that we need to keep it that way and that we're like, we're under threat right. from ideas outside and ideas within, and we need to preserve that. 
Um, it gets a little complicated, but like, I mean, that's kind of the way I'm just describing. That's the thought process right, right. of my upbringing. Okay. And so those were the ideas that I was familiar with. Um, yeah. You talked about social norms in India that are not social norms here in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, you know, there's an interesting, um, you see a lot of different things uh, abroad. And so one of the things in India that was kind of weird when I saw it um, is that people will hold hands like two, two men who are friends mm -hmm. will hold hands or be far more um, affectionate in public than you would see in the US. So, you know, here, if you see two men holding hands, it's viewed in more of a sexualized lens or more of a relationship lens, like, oh, um, they must be gay or something like that. In India, two best friends who are not gay in any way can hold hands in public as a show of affection mm. and closeness. And culturally, it's only perceived as that so you know as a westerner you know i saw this a lot okay and it was kind of weird i was like what is going on right and i mean <laughs> constantly double taking yeah i'm just like what is going on and you know then you know the people i was with and then i did some online research and realized no this is like this is like viewed completely differently mm. here um so yeah, that would just be an example of a cultural custom that is not good or bad. It's just different. Right. It's just different. And like it something can be viewed um through a different lens depending on where you're living. Yeah. Early so kind of circling back earlier to ethnocentrism and you mentioned it's an anthropology term. I have a friend who is an anthropo anthropology major um in undergrad mm -hmm. and she defined for me what anthropology was because i feel like it's one of those classes that when you're in college everyone says oh you should take anthro one or whatever because yeah because it's easy <laughs> and it fills a requirement but no one really knows um, anything past that and she said anthropology is unique because especially in contrast to sociology sociologists are often or usually the people who observe a culture from an outside perspective okay um, someone who comes in and, you know, gathers data, observational data, um, and maybe, you know, puts together information on how a culture functions, but it's all from, like you mentioned, maybe their own perspective. Um, so like, like a, they would put together like a sociological profile of this place or something right, like that, right. an assessment. It's, yes. It seems like the birth rate is this and women seem to have this role in society and things like that. Yeah. And anthropologists, historically, according to my friend, will actually immerse themselves within that culture and society rather than being outside of it and observing it outside. So I guess rather than observational data, it's almost experiential data where yeah. they will be part of it. They will do their best to learn the culture's norms, to understand from within the culture how it functions. Um, and a lot of from... Uh, what my friend was saying, a lot of what we understand about even what the definition of a tribe is and things like that come from anthropology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a place for sociology. I also think there's a place for anthropology. But to a certain extent, I feel like anthropology does every culture justice because it takes the time to be immersed in it and to be a part of it. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if somebody just looking from the outside would necessarily or say maybe they just did all their research off the internet, didn't really go to India, Yeah, would pick up on some of the things you did. So I mentioned um, other customs. You yeah. already said the horn honking. Yes, that was very different. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit about the advertisements you saw in the newspapers. Yeah. So, you know, in the West, in America, 
people get married for love, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I feel like this is, uh, I mean, they do in India too, to a certain degree. Right. But I love reading the newspaper when I go to certain places, right? Now, I have to admit, I was picking up English newspapers in India. So right. I'm already, the thing about India is like, there's 22 languages listed in the constitution. There's even more languages that are spoken. Um, the whole country doesn't speak the same language. Like half the country speaks Hindi, but you know, sometimes if there's different people from different regions and they have to speak the language that's common to them. And sometimes maybe it's only English or, or another language. Okay. So I only experienced like urban India for a time. Right. There's many different regions, many different languages, many different. So I picked up an English newspaper in a city. So I'm getting the flavor of that world. Right. That world. You know, so not to speak broadly about like all the customs of the country. But what I saw was something that you would not see in the U.S., I guess in the same way. And it was called it. They were matrimonial advertisements, like okay. classified ads to find a husband or a wife and it was broken down by religion caste so your social rank in mm -hmm. society and um really yeah really those two really those two things and and maybe like region or something like that but so fascinating to read because you go to this section of the newspaper and it would literally say something like, you know, a uh, Muslim family looking for um, a Muslim man to marry their daughter. Um, daughter is 26 years old, uh, such and such education and does such and such job. Okay. Um, or it would be like a Brahmin Hindu family looking for um, a wife for their doctor son looking for someone of equal status. Um, you know, he's 29 and slim. Like it, <laughs> you know, WhatsApp this number. <laughs> like, like that so fascinating. <laughs> so fascinating. Um, and I, I don't know all of the dynamics behind that, but it, obviously there's, there's a little bit of a different approach to love and relationships mm -hmm. right it's not just like finding someone who makes you happy and that you love right. and if your family likes them great if they don't well, yes as a byproduct of your relationship right like you know your family may not like them or they might like them if they like them great that's a good thing <laughs> but i feel like in america most young people are like are just gonna marry who they want to marry and <laughs> you know if mom and dad don't like it then whatever what stood out to me about the ad was no mention of these are their interests this is what they do in their downtime they they would love to travel to these places it was all very yeah cool. yeah honestly i i can say with confidence that in the class in the ads that i read i never saw really anything like that it was mainly focused on the social social standing right and i think you know, the, the marriage thing, I'm sure love marriage obviously happens in India, uh, just like here, but I think marriage is viewed a little bit differently. And then it's kind of a social contract. It's kind of a, a transaction between two families. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to find an ideal pairing, um, to right. further, um, the advancement of our families, mm -hmm. um, which honestly, I think historically is pretty normal right. in a lot of places. Yeah, it, it might actually be the case that this obsession with romantic love that we tend to have in Western culture, especially in the last hundred years, might be the abnormal thing. Yeah, and that's a really good example of this theme that we're talking about where, okay, 4%, this is not historically what has been the case so if there are some things going wrong in the united states i don't think we can necessarily be surprised and so i'm curious along these lines what benefits 
do you see to having a um, more, I guess, whether you want to call it arranged marriage or treating marriage more as like a social contract, in your opinion? I mean, I'm definitely not in a, not an authority to, to speak on this, but um, I mean, it makes sense. It makes pragmatic sense, like practical sense to arranged marriage in some ways, like because there are a lot of factors when choosing a, a mate or a partner that are beyond just your feelings towards them. Right. Like, do are do you guys believe the same things? Um, do you are you headed in the same direction? Um, yeah, are your families going to get along? Like, yeah. uh, do your goals align? Like, I feel like all of that is pretty valid mm -hmm. and i mean i've i've heard from from different people um who have been in arranged marriages that you know sometimes they work out pretty well but i think there's just a lot of a lot of sacrifice that goes uh, that goes into making them making them work not speaking from experience <laughs> <laughs> right um this one actually I want to bring up too, because you told me that in Delhi, the Metro or the train cars mm -hmm. were segregated Yeah, into men only cars and women only cars. Yeah. I had to look into this because that was, this was actually pretty weird to me because I took the Metro a lot and there were women's only cars on the Metro. And this is not just in India. This is in other countries too. Um, but it was kind of confusing. I was like, why? I mean, I've been in subways and metros all over, you know, they're all co-ed. Um, but when I did some online research, it really came down to, I think it is a density thing again. Okay. There's a lot of people and I think they were having, um, sexual assault uh, problems or like even like just groping problems on the trains. Mm -hmm. And so it was just more, um, it was safer to have dedicated cars for women and then like school aged children. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. It just, it the the dynamic between men and women in india seemed different to me mm -hmm. like i remember this was in 2014 when i was in delhi there were there's a lot of like things all over the city that are just painted or posters or like psas almost right. kind of all over the city mm -hmm. um about the environment or about um yeah any sort of social issue and then one of the things that i kept seeing over and over again uh, all over the city when I was there was this poster um, that said, when a woman speaks, listen. Hmm. And so I'm not 100% sure the um, how women are viewed in India, like all the complications around that, but it did seem different. Like it seemed that right. they had a, that a different social standing um, that is different than what I'm used to, you know, in, in America, it was like men and women are equal. Right. And, um, there, it didn't seem totally like that. It seemed like a woman's voice or a woman's point of view mm -hmm. was not always viewed the same way as a man's point of view. And I think even the way women were treated, I think sometimes was different and that manifested itself in something like, you know, we need to have a train car for, for just women because, right. um, you know, men might be inappropriate, um, in right. close quarters in a train car, which seems insane to me. Like I can't imagine going on a, on a Metro system and seeing a man do something like that. But it's, that is, um, it's a reality. It's yeah. like, it's, it's real. What it's out to me is that in the United States, when we hear of segregation or even see segregation, I'm sure in some parts of the country still, it 
we associate that with a certain group of people being put down. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like based on what you're saying, it's actually for the protection of the women in this case. At least in the online research I did, yes, it was more of a practical protection thing. Like we've had problems Mm -hmm. and this is not just India, but other countries too. Like we've had problems with sexual assault. And one way of solving that is just to split to create a safe space for women only on the train right um i mean having i mean the train is really packed i mean really (laughs) packed so you know i i could see i could see um there being problems and you you hear you hear stories um yeah about things happening at least when we were there okay that were kind of just shocking in public spaces of the way women were treated and um yeah so it was that was just something that i i wasn't expecting that was weird when i saw it okay yeah got it i want to go into the statistics that you put together (laughs) so nicely i don't know if we mentioned your background but you are an accountant yes so you do love numbers you have your master's of public administration yes yeah basically local government i work in local government got it I'll let you I'll let you go for it because I think these excite you. Yeah, no, I <laughs> a couple um even before this episode, like last year sometime, I kind of just did a deep dive on population statistics and um age expectancy statistics. Okay. Cause this is this whole podcast writes about I used to think. Right. So something that really has changed the way that I see the world in particular, the time in which we live is some of this data about population growth over the 20th and 21st centuries. Okay. And I don't think people realize how crazy transformative um, some of this stuff has been over the last hundred years i can confirm this for myself because you brought this up in a conversation a couple weeks ago and my mind was blown yeah i mean it it's staggering if people let these statistics like sink (laughs) in like it's really crazy to think about and so just for some context like i was doing some research on like uh businesses related to like the elderly and like older age people Mm -hmm. like last year And so I was looking into like, well, you know, how many people over 65 are there and how many there used to be and how many are there going to be in the future? And like, and so this kind of made me uncover this stuff, but like, okay, for example, now again, grain of salt population data is tough. This is, these are give or take numbers, but they're from a good source. They're from the (laughs) UN.org. Okay. Population. In the year 1900 it is estimated that there were only 1.3 billion people on the planet you said 1900 1900 so turn of the 20th century theodore roosevelt is president you know digging the panama canal you know all that stuff (laughs) okay it is estimated there were 1.3 billion people on the planet by 1950 that had doubled so there were like 2.8 billion people okay until we get to 2022 last year and there are 8 billion people so in 120 years global population has gone up by over six and a half billion people it that is more people than has like than popu- population has never grown that fast. Right. Like that is an insane number because I don't know how they really know this, but it, the estimate is that there were only about only between like 200 and 300 million people alive at the time of Jesus. So, you know, zero AD. Which and I looked up the current population in the US is about 330 million. So, right. So 
there were only a little bit less people on the entire planet than currently live in the U.S. when Jesus was living. Okay. And it took us, um, it took us 1900 years to get to 1.3 billion people. Yeah, it was slow. Like growth was a lot slower. It was really slow and really slow. And I, I don't know all the, I'm not a doctor. I don't know all the reasons for all of that, but I mean, I know it, it has to do with technology. It has to do with, yeah. um, with child mortality and, right. um, you know, uh, the death of mothers and childbirth and, um, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff that, that go into that. But I was just blown away that we have added about six and a half billion people since the turn of the 20th century to the global population. And the estimates are that we'll plateau somewhere around 10 and a half billion in like 2085. How we know that, you know, I don't know, but it's <laughs> like, that's what the the models are predicting. And then if you want to, if you want to have your mind blown even more, okay, well, if population is growing so much, where where is it growing you know good question and over half of the population growth that's anticipated between now and 2050 is going to be in africa so is life expectancy increasing in africa i think life expectancy is increasing everywhere okay everywhere in the world in general actually i think the u.s life expectancy expectancy went down a little bit But in general, on the whole, average life expectancy is going way up. Um, I mean, for context, too, this just seems really low. This seems really low, okay? But this is from ourworldindata.org. Okay. um, Which I think is a... It's a... It's a data lab. It's a registered charity in England and Wales. Okay. okay. So it seems, seems... Whatever that means for you for credibility. Fairly legit. Right. Le- legit to me. Okay. <laughs> that average global life expectancy of someone in the 19th century was 29 years old. I mean, in the United States, if you're 29, you, you're just about figuring out your life. Yeah. Right? You just stopped vaping or whatever, and you're... <laughs> yeah you know if you went to school you're just out of school you're like you know in the first little bit of your career maybe you're married maybe you're not like right. you're figuring it out you're, you're like in your 20s yeah you, you you're like looking forward to the next 40 years 50 years well on average in the 19th century you might have been dead by 29 <laughs> you you would have had so much wisdom to share to the younger generations as a 29 year old yeah, I mean, it, it's super crazy. I mean, so like, but by 1950, average global life ex- expectancy had gone up to 46 years old. In the US, it was 68. Um, so there was definitely, a dis- there's probably a disparity between developing countries right. and developed countries. I'm sure. And so I'm sure the average, the average probably seems really low compared to like a developed country with access to healthcare. Um, and a higher socioeconomic um, status but so yeah but average 19th century was 29 the year 1950 the average was 46 on a global level and then in 2015 the average was 71 okay Um, significant increase yeah significant increase so i think i mean honestly most of the stuff that i watch there's this awesome youtube channel and some guy from sweden and it's called small circles forward and he does <laughs> he does all of these interesting visual he does um statistics and demographics mm. um visualization with like wood blocks okay and he did this whole series about like reasons to be positive about the world oh and he's just or like reasons that the world is a better place than ever Mm-hmm. And he basically just gives all of these crazy statistics of how over the last 20, 120 years, 
we've eradicated certain diseases and people are dying of are not dying of things they used to die of and yeah. people aren't mothers aren't dying in childbirth as much as they used to and and babies are surviving and um life expectancy has gone up and all of these amazing things um and you watch it and you feel really good <laughs> <laughs> but i think that that's that's proven by the life expectancy data of like how technology is advanced people are living longer mm -hmm. um and thankfully i mean that's happening on a global level not just in certain parts of the world right I'll include all this in the notes for fellow population nerds who want to <laughs> geek out with us. But to tie this back into what we were saying earlier, so how do all these numbers affect the way you see the world or the center of the world? Go back to your statement. Yeah, yeah. So like, I guess it directly to the statement, it's more of like most of the lived experience of human beings is not an American experience. Mm. So I used to think the US was the center of the world. Then I went to India. That's kind of tongue in cheek in the sense of there's just a lot of people, other places live in a different way of life. And yeah. so it's kind of um, nearsighted of me to think that, uh, where I live and um, the people group I'm a part of is the center of the world. Right. Um, so really, really, it's a it's a population thing. That that's what shifted my mind, and mm -hmm. and just me going to India was like the catalyst for me starting to think about that. Um, and so it it changes the way I look at the world, um, because I just ask it kind of changes the way that I look at objective truth. So okay, I believe in objective truth. I believe that there are things that are true for everyone everywhere. Um, moral truths, um, like, uh, I mean, obviously math is math everywhere. You know, there are, <laughs> there are things that are just true, right? There are Good objective point. truths. But... I think um, what I've started to view differently is that maybe some of the things that I think are true or the way things ought to be are really just what I'm used to. Mm, ought to be, right. Yeah. Like my sense of oughtness might be different than someone else's sense of oughtness. And that might not be a bad thing. It's just different. Right. So I, I want to... I want to bring up um, my thoughts on this, but first, how is that a comfort to you? How is it a comfort to me? Yeah, or is it? Um, I think it's. I think it's more of just a prioritization thing. Okay. It's like, well, it is a comfort to me in the sense that I don't need to stress about things that are just culturally different okay like major in the major in the majors uh don't major in the minors like um hmm. what am i trying to say it's more of like you don't need to try to impose your cultural expectations onto someone else um because at the end of the day it doesn't really matter that much does that make sense okay and when you say someone else you mean someone from another country yeah okay that makes sense yeah got it like we don't need to be on a mission to make everybody like us mm -hmm. um that that to me would be misguided right I like that. Yeah, that makes sense. A so after you brought up all this stuff um, on our initial phone call, I thought about the things that make up the American dream. And you've hinted on this, on, hinted on some of those things in our conversations. One being owning a lot of real estate <laughs> or at the <laughs> very least owning a home. 
Um, I'm in the real estate industry. I, I talk about real estate a lot. People want to own a home. It's just, it's part of the American dream. Mm -hmm. And I will start off by saying first, I don't think it's an objectively bad thing because it's my work. Yeah. So I want it to be a thing. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, also though, that realizing this tension, right. Between, okay. Why is it that I want this so badly? Am I, could I be okay? And I'll just talk about for myself because I do want to own a home. Yeah. Um, talking for myself, why do I want to do this? Like, will I be more okay? It's almost an issue of happiness. And I think this is where my mind went with comfort. Um, I'll also use the word happiness is these conversations have made me see that my baseline for happiness could be much different if I chose to mm -hmm. make it different. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned Asia and how most people's housing situations are in Asia. Mm -hmm. Um I mentioned my friend who's currently in China. He he was FaceTiming me from a high rise that he was staying at. It was his grandmother's apartment. And if pretty like, I can't say all of Asia, but I've been to Japan, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. My family's Taiwanese. Pretty much everyone lives in high rises. To throw in another statistic, I believe more people live in the city of Tokyo, Japan than in all of Canada. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And he showed me a view from his grandmother's balcony of these three high-rise buildings. And if I remember correctly, each building has about 40 floors. And then each floor has three to four units, apartment units. And he was telling me, he said, Pat, do you realize that these three high-rises combined have about 10,000 people living in it? So insane. And I wondered to myself, okay, do these people think, man, I really wish I had more real estate? Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe they do. Mm -hmm. um, if they do, I might blame Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> at the same time, there are people who are happy that live in these confined spaces. And in their minds, they don't have a concept of, okay, this is a temporary thing. Eventually I'll have a backyard. Right, right. And I think real estate and home is is a good example to bring up because home matters to all of us as humans. Mm -hmm. It's a really important thing. There are only a few like tribes throughout the world that are actually nomadic and have a sense of home. Right. I don't know. Did you bring that up? Or I uh, no, I somewhere. don't think I did. You must okay. have heard it somewhere else. I, just, I heard it somewhere else. Um, And so, yeah, along the lines of this American dream thing, I found that, okay, I can choose to be happy where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be a good example of something that is cultural. Mm. You know, like in the United States, we have certain expectations about the way we think life should be. And there is a there is a particular answer to the question, I have arrived. Mm. And part of arriving is owning a house and paying off that house. <laughs> probably <laughs> hopefully um uh, or and and perhaps for some i mean this probably is different in different parts of the united states depending on what you value mm -hmm. but for most people that's probably like a single family home with a yard and space for your family and space for the dog and all that stuff and maybe two refrigerators the drink one and right? the regular one Absolutely. You know, you got to have a fridge in the garage. You know, you got to have a wine cooler. I mean, like these Neanderthals that don't have that stuff. So, I mean, well, okay. So, and it's very contextual, right? Because like in Southern California, I'm just hoping and praying to get on the property ladder at all. Mm -hmm. If you live in a cheaper part of the country and have means, you know, right. maybe, maybe for you, nor like arriving is having your house, but then also having a shore house. Right. Like I've got a friend who had his parents have a shore house in the Jersey shore. And then they also have their house in Philadelphia. And a lot of people have that <laughs> and that's normal, you know? Uh, I mean, yeah, normal for who, you know, that, see, that's the, that's the thing about all of these standards, all of these um, answers to the question I have arrived Yeah, is like, it's all based on who you're around and the expectations of the people around you. Yes. Um, so I, I think kind of what you what you alluded to of what is required to be happy as a human being. Mm. Owning a home 
I don't think really is required. I think in the US, it might be a prerequisite. But I think it really doesn't have to do with ownership. It has to do with stability, having a place to mm, live, right? having a stable place to live, whether you rent it or you own it, knowing where you can reliably be. I mean, I think that's kind of an instinctual human thing, mm-hmm. um, kind of like that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like needing your physical needs met. <laughs> and I think because of our uh socioeconomic um status in the US to a certain degree getting your physical needs met mm. is like a lot higher <laughs> than than other than other places right and it's funny because that can lead to a lot of discontentment that can lead to a lot of feeling like you haven't um achieved enough Mm. so it kind of you kind of have to um analyze what the culture says should be your goals decide if you think that they are worth it or truly valuable and then kind of go from there and it can be uncomfortable uncomfortable to be countercultural especially to your realtor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This this episode might backfire on me. Yeah. <laughs> we might start a whole movement of anti-homeowners and, yeah. that are just pro-happiness, contentment, and I'll just all my income is gone. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example from my personal life. I really do want to own a house. Yeah. But I want to own a house because I want a stable, permanent place to live. Mm-hmm. But let me do a thought experiment with you. I like character. And I like certain types of houses. Like I want like a historical house. Okay. If I can't afford that, I would rather rent in a place that I like mm. right. than own in a place I don't want to live. And I think a lot of people are in that situation because of the pressure of ownership. That's a good point. Yeah. And I think people who love a place, like Think about like a New Yorker, for example. I don't, I mean, most New Yorkers, I don't think they're going to own a house, right? right? But they love New York. And so they're okay with renting there. Yeah. So I think if you like where you live and you like the place more than necessarily the dwelling, mm-hmm. then you have to make trade-offs. Right. Yeah. And that's something I noticed the difference between me and my wife, Jess, is I like the areas that I live, the people, the culture the lifestyle and she's much more of a homebody and so for her being able to be at home have space have um comfortable amenities and appliances in the house do Mm -hmm. matter more to her um but so that but that you bring up a good point because you used the word prioritization before Mm -hmm. and i think when for me this conversation is a comfort because I'm seeing now, okay, I can choose to prioritize certain things rather than seeing them as expectations, right? I'm a failure if I don't reach the standard. I'm a mm-hmm. failure if I don't achieve this thing. Um, I'm curious, when you're in India, did you feel like the people there were happy? Yes. Okay. And that that is so crazy to me in a lot of ways. Um, that, that is why joy and happiness cannot be based on, um, on achievement. Mm. I'm not saying that there were people there living in some really hard situations, Mm. like because of the density. And I mean, I taught English as a second language in a slum area. I mean, Mm. these people had very little and were living in very close quarters in like slum towns often on illegal land Mm. you know like this whole community was on land that they didn't even own it right but i mean then there's a lot of pain there's a lot of pain i mean human the human experience is painful Mm -hmm. um but i did see laughter and i did see joy and i saw kids running around and playing and 
You know, it it's funny. It it exists there too, though. The status thing, like smartphones, are a big deal. Okay. So, like, the type of smartphone that you have is kind of <laughs> is kind of like a, a signal. Do they like, care about iPhones? Oh, iPhone is like, you know, for like really bougie people. Oh, I see. You okay. know, um, at least that's what somebody told me once. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, in every society, there's going to be some sort of ranking, some sort of like signals of um of status or like right. goals that's a good point but absolutely like you know everybody has expectations based on how they've grown up mm -hmm. of what they think they need to be happy the baseline that you mentioned like oh if i didn't have this this or this how would i live um yeah i think their baseline is is lower um for some of the for some of the the poor the the poor people that live there and like but they're still they still experience joy and happiness and you know family and um yeah i i mean i think to overlay it with like the the christian perspective um mm. it's really about where your where your joy is and life can be very difficult. Um, but for some of the Christians that I met there, like their their joy was in the gospel. Their joy was in was in um knowing Jesus. Um, and they found a lot of uh a lot of comfort there. And so I think they were less maybe distracted by some of the material distractions that I might have in my life here. I think that's a good segue to one of your last sections on Christianity implications. I don't yeah. know that might have been a, a purposeful transition, so that was very smooth of you. <laughs> um, what thoughts did you have on this, um, especially in regards to Christianity and how it is a universal religion? Yeah, I think that was one of the also... Um... I used to think aspects of this. So I think I used to have a very American centric idea of what Christianity was. And um, I think this happens in politics. And I mean, it's, it's natural to wherever you live to want to advance what you think is good, true and beautiful in that place, you know, so it's like, I'm not saying it's bad to fight for certain things or advocate for what you believe in or, you know, um, overlay your Christian beliefs with the direction that you think America should go or another right. country should go. But I guess what I'm, what my perspective shifted is that Christianity is a universal religion it applies if you believe christianity mm -hmm. then you must believe that it applies to every human being living in every context around the world mm -hmm. every human being is made in the image of god mm -hmm. so that means that christianity the message of it and the application of it needs to be is relevant to a Muslim living in Indonesia or a Hindu living in Delhi or somebody living in South Africa. Like this is a universal message and faith and religion. And, and it's the core of it is not going to look different necessarily. I mean, um, the outworking might based on your cultural context, hmm. but it's a universal message for everyone. And so I think um, how that kind of changed my view of Christianity in some ways is that I think it's unhealthy to have a Christianity that is overly preoccupied on the politics of a certain country or on seeing certain outcomes happen. Um, we should be asking the question of, what does it mean to be a Christian in any context? Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And this actually kind of came up 
in uh i haven't released it yet but in another podcast interview okay which is yeah it's really interesting now it's come up um again but the idea that if we were to bring christianity into um another culture um via missionaries or what have you it would find some way to be able to apply to that culture and then the people could embrace it um in a healthy way not in ways that it's been presented in the past yeah um and that also there are universal truths to it um that right supersede any cultural differences so the example i actually used in the other episode was to love your neighbor unless you're a a hermit or a monk living somewhere Mm -hmm. who doesn't have a neighbor um who doesn't handle money daily in some way or have to think about money um I don't know why I'm blanking on all of Jesus' teachings yeah. right now. <laughs> but yes, that, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, like the teachings, the like the golden rule of Christianity, um to love your neighbor as yourself. Like that is a universal um teaching that pretty much could do good in any culture or society. Right. Um Jesus, the the gospel message of Jesus, Jesus dying for the sins of people and redeeming them, that applies to all, all people. Mm. Um, And I guess a Christianity that is too preoccupied with political outcomes, which I think sometimes is what we have in the United States, like this this preoccupation with um, advancing the social causes that we believe in or seeing certain people be in government, I guess in light of Christianity being a global religion, sometimes that just doesn't land with me very well. I'm like, is that really the number one, the number one goal? Mm. Are we too focused on trying to make the country Christian? Um, when and making that like a core tenant of christianity like if you're a christian you will advance these beliefs or causes whereas like that might not be relevant to someone who who is a christian living in china or a christian who's living under an authoritarian government and they have no hope of even changing anything about the political system of the country they live in they just need to focus on living their daily life faithfully right um so it kind of broadened my views on the application of Christianity. And I've come to see that it is an important question to ask oneself because I'm not saying a Christian should never run for office. I'm not saying a Christian should not vote. I think both of those things are actually really important. And I feel like this is somewhere we probably would land in the, um, in the same page over, but mm-hmm. I see now that the question I must ask myself first before I, I guess, like you mentioned, assume that these social issues are what I'm supposed to stand for if I call myself a Christian in the United States, is to see, okay, what what did Jesus prioritize? He prioritized community. He hung out with 12 guys. They walked around for three years together and hung out and um, helped the poor and the, and the lame and the blind around them, um, as well as um, teaching. And being able to, I mean, this sounds very shallow, I guess, but almost like spread positivity in a sense, right? Yeah. Like he went around healing people, telling them that there is a hope, um, reminding people of the gospel and the good news, which mm-hmm. we would refer to as Christians, um, rather than uh, alternatives might be um going around attacking people for having false beliefs i mean he did at times yeah with certain religious teachers of the day yeah um, but i see now that um what jesus cared about was actually very few things Com- right it would yep. it would be very few core tenets such as the kingdom of god or loving your neighbor right or caring for the poor um then then from there, okay, whether or not you should vote for somebody, whether or not you should go picket outside a certain institution, right. I think that becomes more of a gray area. Um, but I'm seeing now the 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 
causes that Christ really stood for were were few in number ultimately. Yeah. Um, and more heaven focused than earth focused. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, in Jesus's day, we're, we're, we are kind of approaching this from a democracy perspective where we actually have a voice in society. Right, right. And I think in Jesus's day, it's accurate to say under Roman rule in that area there, I mean, there was no, I don't want to say there weren't, I don't think there were elections. I, I don't actually don't know that. But I don't think I've there were it. elections. I mean, there was a there was an emperor. Maybe rigged elections. Yeah, there was an emperor. I and there was a governor that ruled over Judea, right? And I don't know that. I mean, the the, the classic thing that you you hear um, around Christmas time is that the Jewish people of the day were maybe hoping for someone who would um, overthrow their political oppressors. Right. They still thought about that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it didn't seem like uh, it didn't seem like Jesus's main motivation was um, bringing about political change. It was more about the change of, of people's hearts. Mm. And I mean, that's, the super countercultural thing about him hanging out with tax collectors, AKA people who um, took advantage of, of other people. Right. Um, and collected far more tax than they were supposed to. Modern day Jesus would have hung out in front of the IRS building, <laughs> waited for people to get off work and yeah. gone a beer with <laughs> a modern day. Jesus would have, would have hung out. <laughs> yeah. With the, the tax guy who is falsifying tax returns to pad his own pocket and then invite him over to to dine with him yeah i love that image and and love that person so that they are changed right and he wouldn't be seeking at least the Jesus of the Gospels didn't seem to be advocating for a wholesale reform of the Roman tax system. Because it just probably wasn't realistic. <laughs> it wasn't realistic. You don't think Jesus could have gotten enough signatures? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Let me check really quick if I had any other notes. Okay. Go for it. So yeah, to wrap up, I think something I wanted to make sure I mentioned was, again, ethnocentrism in and of itself is not a negative term, although it has been used as a negative term. Um, and I hope this conversation, or I, I should say, you know, at least for me, you know, my goal isn't to shame people into, oh, you need to travel more, you need to be more woke, or you got to open your eyes to... <laughs> what's going on because you're trapped in your little uh, America bubble. I think again, traveling, not everyone gets to do it. And it's a great opportunity if you can, even, even when I went to Kentucky, I was like, this is <laughs> different to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what other word I would use. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I even tried eating Chinese food in Kentucky, <laughs> but um what a blessing it is when I get to, you, you get to be able to have opportunities to experience other cultures um, and to see that there, maybe they're really, maybe the answer here is there really isn't a center. Um, and it's just a great, every opportunity is a chance to be able to set that baseline for happiness and see that other people can be happy with what they have. Um, is there anything that we missed that you wanted to bring up? Um, you know what? I think, yeah, the last thing I'll say to kind of like, um, bring home the point of, of what is the center of the world. It's like when God looks down at the world, who does he see mm. 
first. I don't know if he sees anybody first necessarily, but it's just like, you know, if all people are made in the image of God and he loves all people, like in a grand theological sense of like, they are his creation. Um, then I think God's care for the world extends beyond um, your individual, your individual country. Mm. And I think that he, and, you know, another thought experiment would be if alien life showed up at planet earth and they were trying to figure out like, where's the center of the earth? Like, where are things happening here? Right. We only have like three days. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, they're going to spend a lot of time in the East because there's a lot of people there doing a lot of things, you know? <laughs> so I just think that, um, yeah, it's, it can be mind altering. It can be perspective shifting to realize that there are, are a lot of, um, a lot of people living a different life experience than you. And yes, ethnocentrism is a completely normal thing. You're going to view the world through your own right. culture. You have Definitely. no way of not viewing the world through your own culture. I think that, you know, the negative of that can be that, okay, my culture is superior and my customs are better and I need to make everybody else like me and they should be like me. Mm -hmm. Like that whole idea of like civilizing the earth or whatever, of like whatever you think is civilized, right? Um, but the goal, kind of going back to your distinction between sociology and anthropology, like before making judgments on another culture, it's pretty important just to put yourself in that culture's shoes and try to understand the way that they live through their perspective. Right. And I just think that that would lead to a lot more understanding of, of human beings, you know, humans understanding each other, hmm. um, taking a step back and, and uh, not looking down from our culture, but looking at their culture from within, if you can. I didn't plan this, but on a very Christmassy note, that is the incarnation. Mm. which is pretty cool to me wow yeah no that's super true yeah <laughs> like yes god did not think it better to just stay in heaven he became flesh and blood mm. and dwelt among us that's pretty amazing wow i didn't expect to to hear a sermon today but <laughs> that was an amazing sermon <laughs> awesome <laughs> well thanks for chatting yeah thanks for being on the show, Caleb. Thank you. Come again. <laughs> when I have something else interesting to say, maybe I'll be back. <laughs> okay.